Okay, so in the last video, we just got cut off with number six. Um, I ended with explaining that because the two angles at R and T are congruent, the two sides RS and ST, those green ones that I highlighted over here, are going to be congruent because of the isosceles base angles theorem of isosceles triangles. If the two angles on the bottom are congruent, then the sides across from them will be congruent. So those two sides act as the hypotenuse of our two triangles that we broke out. So on the left one I have an angle, an angle, and then a side touching just that angle at the top. And then for my triangle on the right, again I have the right angle as my first A, the angle at the top is my second A, and then the side. So it's angle, angle, side for both. And that's how I know the two triangles are congruent because of angle, angle, side. So it's going to be choice F because it gives us that side length because of the isosceles triangle theorem. So again, just a little bit of a better visual. If these two base angles are congruent, then these two sides are going to be congruent. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so with number seven, we pick up again with similar right triangles. Now in this case, we have a set of angles P and S that are congruent. So that gives us a set of angles. And then we have a second set of angles that are congruent here. The vertical angles at R are gonna be congruent. So because of AA similarity, that proves that these two triangles are similar. Now, once triangles are similar, the way that we solve for a missing side length, which in this case we're looking for this side length from P to R, it's the width of the lake. Right? That's how wide the lake is, that little circle thing in the middle that's supposed to represent a lake. So that's going to give us how wide the lake is if we can solve for that line segment. And the way that we do that once our triangles are similar is we set up proportions. Proportions, proportions, proportions. Every time you have similar shapes, you're going to use a proportion. So let's set up our proportion. Now we're going to match things up, and everyone's going to match things up differently. It's just you have to stay consistent. So the way that I'm going to do it, I'm going to match up 40 from my bigger triangle with the 12 from my smaller triangle. And then I'm going to match up the length of PR, which I'll call X, with the length of 8. So here I've matched things up. Now I'm going to cross multiply to get my value of X. 12 times X is 12X. In the calculator I'm going to do 40 times 8. I get 320. I could have done that in my head, but I am not there right now. So. <laughs> And lastly, we are going to divide by 12, and we get 26.6 repeating. Okay, now usually we always think that when we get a number like that, it's wrong because it's not exact, but things in life are not exact. So 26.6 repeating is approximately 26.7, but it's asking us to the nearest foot, so that's the nearest whole number, no decimal. So the sixth is going to tell the 6 and 26 to round up. So nearest foot, choice A, 27. Next question. All right, so hopefully you paused at 8, you drew a visual, you laid out the information that you have, and I'm going to catch up. So they're talking to you about a circle. All right, here's our circle. Now, what do they tell me about the circle? They tell me the circumference of the circle is 8 pi. Now, I need to think about what is the circumference formula, because why are they giving me 8 pi? So I'm going to write down the circumference formula is 2 pi r, or pi times diameter. I use 2 pi r, because most of our formulas use radius, so I like to write 2 pi r. You have to memorize the circumference formula. They do not give it to you. They expect that you know it. All right, so all your area formulas you have to know, your circumference formula you have to know, lots of formulas you have to know. All right, so 2 pi r is my formula for circumference. Okay, now the question asks me to find to the nearest square centimeter the area of the circle, area of the circle. Well, I'm going to write down the area formula and think about what do I need to get this area. So area equals pi r squared. So what I need is r. I need the radius. 
Right now, I don't have the radius of this circle. I need to solve for it, which is why they gave me the circumference. It's going to let me solve for it. So if I know that my circumference is 8 pi and the formula for circumference is 2 pi r, I'm going to set those two things equal. So I'm going to have 2 pi r equals my 8 pi. And here, this variable of r, now I can solve for it. I'm going to start off and I'm going to divide both sides by 2 pi because this way I'm going to get r all by itself. Now on the left hand side, the 2 and the pi are going to cancel. And on the right hand side, the pi's are going to cancel out. So I'm going to get a nice and exact answer. And then 8 divided by 2 is 4. So my radius is 4. Nice and easy, no decimal, nothing. All right, my radius is 4, so let me go up to the problem that I'm trying to solve, which is the area. So I'm going to plug in that radius now. So to get the area, I'm going to do pi times my radius of 4 squared. Now area equals pi times 16. Now the calculator has a pi button, but again in this problem they're asking you to approximate and use 3.14. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plug in 16 times 3.14, not the pi button, equals 50.24. So area of the circle is 50.24 centimeters squared. Now how do I want to round? It says to the nearest square centimeter. Okay, that means no decimal. They did not say to the nearest tenth, the nearest hundredth. They wanted a regular centimeter, no decimal. So I'm going to type in that my answer from rounding to the nearest whole number. The 2 tells me round down and keep it as 50. So 50 centimeters squared is my answer. All right, let's move on. All right, so number nine is a bit of a tricky question. It's going to require a lot of algebra. Now, when you look at this question, you're not sure what to use. Maybe you're thinking use trigonometry. Um, maybe use Pythagorean theorem. Like, you're not sure. Now, what you have to do in this problem, since you see that there is an altitude drawn that goes from your right angle to the hypotenuse of your right triangle, that means you're doing one of two formulas. You're either using whole over leg equals leg over part, the one that we had to dance for, or you're using short over out equals out over long. Now, in this case, we don't have the altitude, and we don't ask to find it. So we're not going to use the second formula. We're going to use the first one. Now, just because we figured out what formula to use does not mean that this is going to be an easy problem. It's not going to be. There's going to be a lot of algebra involved. So let's take a look. Our whole means the whole hypotenuse. So our whole hypotenuse is the x and the 10 together. So it's x plus 10. So I'm going to type in x plus 10 over the leg. The leg of this right triangle is x plus 4 equals the leg x plus 4 over the part, the part of the hypotenuse that's touching your leg. So it's going to be your x, that's your part. Now, once you've set this up, there's a lot of algebra involved, so let's walk through it. You're going to multiply x times x plus 10, that's your first diagonal there. So we're going to write down x times, now this is important, in parentheses is x plus 10 because I want to multiply x by the entire binomial x plus 10. And now on the right hand side, x plus 4 times x plus 4. Now again, I'm going to write down x plus 4 in parentheses times x plus 4 again in parentheses. Now here's going to be a lot of algebra, so let's follow through. All right, first thing we need to do, let's distribute the x. So x times x is x squared x times 10 is 10x. So the left hand side is pretty easy. The right hand side, if you have two binomials, you're going to have to FOIL. Okay, so let's start out first. Okay, so in the FOIL, we do the first. x times x is x squared. All right, next we have to do outer. So x times 4, so it's 4x. 
Next, we do the inner. 4 times x, so it's 4x. And lastly, the last. So 4 times 4, so 16. All right, now let's clean this up. So we have x squared plus 10x, nothing is simplified there, equals x squared. All right, now we have two x terms, so we get 8x plus 16. All right, now at first we think, oh, this is going to be a quadratic, but if I have an x squared on both sides, if I want to subtract x squared from both sides, look what happens. The x squareds cancel out, so we no longer have an x squared. Now we have 10x on the left equals 8x plus 16. And this is a lot simpler. Subtract 8x from both sides. We have 2x equals 16. Divide by 2 and x equals 8. Okay, finally we got our answer. Choice H. Okay, next question, number 10. All right, this is a circle equation question. Now, if you remember the number being subtracted from x and y, in order to figure out the center, you take the opposite sign. So instead of having a plus 10, our center is going to be at negative 10 for its x value. And instead of having a plus, I'm sorry, instead of having negative 10 at y, we're going to change the sign and it's going to be a positive 10 for the y value of our center. So looking at our choices, we're already crossing out C and D because those are not the correct center. Okay, that's where the tricky part is. You change the sign of x and y when you're looking at your center of a circle equation. Now, in terms of our two choices, we have a radius of 4 radical 3 and 48. Now, if you remember, this 48, that represents your radius squared. So if we want to just get the radius, we need to undo this square. Let me zoom in. Okay, so we have the radius squared equals 48. Square root both sides, so r equals the square root of 48. Now automatically that means that choice b cannot be correct because I don't have a radius of 48, I have the square root of 48. Now you could try this out in your calculator and make sure that 4 times the square root of 3 equals 48. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. 3 square root times 4 is this weird 6.9 number. And then if I just do 48 square root, it's that 6.9 number. So they are equivalent. And if you do want to go through the process of simplifying your radical, because that's all that is, the 4 radical 3 is a simplified radical, I'm going to show you how. So we're going to break up the square root of 48 into two factors, where one of the factors is the largest perfect square that can go into 48. Okay, so think about your perfect squares. We have 1 squared, which is 1, 2 squared, which is 4, 3 squared, which is 9, uh, I lost track, oh, 4 squared, which is 16, 5 squared, which is 25. So these are our choices because anything larger than that's not going to go into 48. Now, from this list, 16 is the largest perfect square that will go into 48. 48 divided by 16 is 3. So in these two boxes, I'm going to put 16 and 3 as my two factors of 48. Now I can take the square root of 16 and I'm going to get 4. The square root of 3 is not a nice number, so we keep it as radical 3. And that's how they get in the problem 4 radical 3 as the radius. It's a simplified radical. So it's going to be choice A for this problem. Okay, tune into the next video while I continue with number 11.